invite you to take out your Bibles and turn with me to that psalm. And if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, it can be found on page 621. And as you turn there, let me say I've titled this message, Building Enduring Faith. Building Enduring Faith. Many people believe that, you know, it's, it's good enough just to have faith, but there will come a time in our lives when our faith will be tested. And it is at that point that we will know if we have enduring faith. That is, faith that will withstand the pressures of this life. And so if you have that out, let me invite you to rise once more as we read the infallible, inerrant word of the living God. The psalmist writes these words, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Let us pray. Our Holy Father and most gracious God, we are so thankful, we are so grateful for these words. We're thankful, O God, that you have put this into the heart of the psalmist to write these words, to record them, not only for themselves during that period of time when people were singing these words, O God, but for us as well. May we see these words in a new light this day, O God, and may they leave, by the power of your Holy Spirit, an indelible mark upon our hearts. For we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask you this morning, do you possess enduring faith? Think about that. Do you possess enduring faith? Chances are, if you're, uh, if you're here this morning, you are a believer in Christ, and so then that shows us that you do have faith, that is, Trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. If you don't, I pray that today you would put your trust and your faith in Him as Savior and Lord. But having faith in Christ is not the same as having enduring faith. You see, enduring faith endures all things. It endures the sufferings, the trials, the hardships of life. Now sometimes you say, okay, well, you know what? I'm young. I see a couple of young faces here this morning. I really don't have sufferings. I go to school. I got my problems there in school and this and that, but I really don't have sufferings. Mom and dad, they take care of everything. If I have an issue, I go to them. They take care of it, and I'm all right. But that's not so because we know that even if we're young or if we're older, sometimes it's a problem living out our faith because we're going to be challenged by the world. Remember our three enemies, sin, Satan, and the world? Right? The sin is the things that we want over and above what God wants for us. Satan is always seeking to attack us, either through um, people or through situations. And then, of course, is the world. The world is always trying to tell us, you don't need Jesus. You're all right. You've got your whole life ahead of you. you, you you've, got, you've got promotions that you've got to work towards. There's so many things that you can have in this life. You know, you're not frail. You're strong. You don't need Jesus. And so our faith is always being attacked in one way or another. But Scripture calls us to have enduring faith, faith that will endure all things. That's why I want to focus this morning on that word, enduring, enduring. You see, this psalm is a psalm of ascent, and it's a psalm that teaches us um, how to endure in God's word. So what is enduring faith? Let's break that down. Let's make it a little bit more practical. What's enduring faith? Well, it's trusting in God in times of uncertainty. Now, any confessor believer will tell you, well, you're supposed to be trusting in God all the time. Sadly, however, 
we tend to trust in ourselves during times when everything is going right. And only when times of uncertainty are upon us, when times of difficulty are upon us, that we realize, well, wait a minute. I can't handle this on my own. That's when we want to trust in God. Now, that's a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. It can be a bad thing when the only times we ever trust in God is when we're going through times of uncertainty. But when we are in uncertain times, it's important for us to remember, hey, wait a minute. I need to develop a faith that endures all things. Here's some other ways that we realize we need enduring faith. When we're going through doubts with our belief, doubts with our, with, with our personalities. You know, am I really a Christian? Is this faith mine or is it my parents? Is this faith mine or is it my church's? Is it my husband's? Is it my wife? Is it my friend's faith or is it my faith? That's a good place to be because that's God preparing us to be strengthened by our faith. Then there's other times when we're having troubles at home. Family members, maybe brothers and sisters, husband and wives, parents and children, siblings, whatever the case may be, right? Those are times when we need to understand we need enduring faith because there are many times in our lives when the people closest to us are going to be the ones hurting us or injuring us, and that has a strong possibility of injuring us in our walk with Christ. Then, of course, there's the job, right? Oh, the blessed job. It's a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing because we have an income. It's a blessing because we're able to provide for our families. But man, they're just always beating us down. Sometimes you go to work and you feel like I'm just never good enough. Perhaps they're going to look for someone else. But these are the times when we need enduring faith. We need to trust in God and say, you know what, Lord? I'm just going to follow you. I'm just going to follow your lead. I'm going to put my full faith and trust in you because it is from you that my help comes. Enduring faith is about trusting God all the time, in all things. It's not picking and choosing what we want to trust God with. It's saying, Lord, you have complete control and authority over my life. Now, whether you say that or not, God still has complete authority over your life. But it's important that we confess that to God, that we say, Lord, I, I want to stop fighting you and I want to give everything over to you. I want for you to lead me. Beloved, we all face trials. And trials prove to be the testing of our faith. But know this. The trials, you may be going through a trial right now. The trials that you're going through could either be something that tears you down or you could find blessings in it. Yes, we can find blessings in our trials. This psalm shows us exactly that. But know this, when we face trials, when we feel like our faith is being tested, right? This is God allowing us to be strengthened so that we may grow in enduring faith. James speaks about faith. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, he says this, count it all joy, right? Now, when, if, 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 if I was to obscure the rest of that scripture, you would think that he's going to talk about something really fun, something really exciting. And what does James say to count all joy? When you meet trials of various kinds. Oh, wait a minute, what are you talking about, James? I thought being a Christian meant that my life was going to be great. That the birds were going to begin to sing. That the, the weather was going to get nice and everything was just going to be beautiful in my life. What do you mean? But he says, here's how we grow. Here's how you grow as a confessing believer. Count a little joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith, yes, trials, Test our faith. Why does God test our faith? In order to, to build in us enduring faith. That that trial produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Lacking in nothing. And so as we go throughout trials, as we go throughout our sufferings, as we go throughout the testing of our faith, 
and we stick to God's word and we never leave his side, then we build enduring faith. And so this psalm teaches us how to have enduring faith. And that's what we're going to see in Psalm 121 before us this day. This psalm can be broken out into three portions. So I want to draw your attention to the first portion, verses 1 and 2. And then we see that enduring faith requires trusting in God's sovereign power. Now those are big theological words, some of them in there, right? But they speak to the fact that God, yes, is in control of all things. Now just because we stray does not mean that God's not in control. If we stray, it's because God has allowed us to stray. But know this, we will deal with the consequences of our straying. And all of that should bring us back to the understanding that God is sovereign over our lives. The psalmist begins with this. I lift up my eyes to the hill. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Notice how he's acknowledging who God is. He's, he's saying, you know what? I'm going to go through struggles in my life, but I lift my eyes up to the hill. And in order to be able to lift your eyes up to the hill, you've got to take your eyes off of what is bringing you down at that very moment, that which has the potential to harm you. Now, I mentioned before that this is a psalm of ascent, right? You're looking up to the hills. Well, when would people sing this psalm? Well, they would sing it when they were heading back to Jerusalem three times a year for the holy days. And so here's the idea. Jerusalem is the city on the hill. And as you go toward that city, your eyes are focused on it. Your eyes are focused on how you will be worshiping God in it. Your eyes are focused on how you will glorify God in the time of worship for whatever the festival is. Your eyes are solely focused on that, so you're taking your eyes off of your issues, off of your problems, and you're focusing them on the hill. Now there's a problem. Because to get to the hill, you've got to go through the valley. And there's where the problems lie. There's where the problems lie. Because what's hiding in the valleys? Well, it's the animals. It's the bears. It's, 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 the, it's the tigers. It's those animals, the wolves, that are seeking to snatch whatever's walking through the valley trying to get to the hill. But there's something else there. There's thieves and there's robbers, right? Thieves take by, by force and robbers take by deception. And so there's thieves and robbers there. And so there was a lot of threats to the believer as they ascended on up to Jerusalem. And so what would they sing? Well, simply they would sing, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And please notice the affirmation there. The psalmist is saying, I am recognizing God that you are the creator of heaven and of earth and everything in it. Therefore, I will trust in you because it is you that has created me. It is you. And when God creates us, the scriptures tell us he's created us in his image. Why? For his glory. And so the psalmist is basically saying back to God, I'm going to trust in you because you are the creator of me. And I know that since you have created me in your image and for your glory, that it is you that will protect me. You see how faith can build and just that understanding, Lord, my life is, is a mess right now. My, I'm going through problems right now. But I lift my eyes to the hills because from you is where my help comes. You are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the sovereign over all things. Therefore, I will trust in you. It's kind of like living on the mountaintop, right? And looking out and saying, the Lord is the Almighty. Yeah, you know, what's in front of me right now may be scary. What's in front of me right now may seek to harm me. What's in front of me right now may seem lethal. It may seem like it wants to take me down, but I lift my eyes to the hills because that's from where my help comes. But beloved, building enduring faith doesn't stop there no we need to reaffirm these truths in our lives 
over and over again. And then we need to add to them as the psalmist does in the second part of this psalm. So let me draw your attention to verses 3 through 6. And in them we see that enduring faith requires reaffirmation of God's physical protection. So the psalmist understands it is God has created me, therefore He will protect me. And now he begins to enumerate how the Lord will protect him. And his, his, his reaffirmation is basically telling God this, I believe in you. I trust you. And many of these psalms highlight this for us. That's why I always say, go to the psalms. You want to really have a better outlook on life? You want to develop an enduring faith? Go to the psalms because they constantly speak about the struggles that we go through as human beings and how God stands ready to lead us out. Saying to God, I believe that you will protect me and that you will guide me. The psalmist says in verse 3, he, referring to God, will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. You know, he, he's reaffirming in his own heart, in his own mind, God never sleeps. You know, we sleep on God, but God never falls asleep on us. And he will not allow your foot to slip, to slip into danger, to slip into chaos, to slip into outer darkness. He says he will not allow your enemies to overtake you. Isaiah speaks about the fact that no weapon formed against you will prosper. And who says that? It's the Lord. He says that. He says, I promise you that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes we're in the, we're in the thick of our problems. It doesn't feel that way. But that's when we need to go back to God. And say, Lord, I trust in you. Why? Because I know in you my foot will never be moved. And you never slumber. He goes on to say, behold. And this is really like the psalmist telling you, hey, take a look at this. Understand this. Understand the magnitude of these words. He who keeps Israel will never sleep, will never slumber nor sleep. And he's, he's identifying this. He's saying, look at how often and how faithful God has saved Israel. In the same manner, he will save you. He has saved Israel as a nation. I mean, look at Israel today. With all of the attacks that Israel endures, it still exists. Why? Because God has decreed that it would. Behold, he who keeps Israel, the same way he keeps Israel, he will neither sleep nor slumber on you. The Lord is your keeper, right? He's your keeper. This, this psalm has to become very personal for us. He's your keeper. He's my keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand, which is saying the Lord is going to keep you in righteousness. He's not going to allow your righteousness to slip from you. That once he gifts it to you, it is yours forever. And he will protect it. Why? Because he is your keeper. The world may make you feel like you have no keeper, like there's no one on your side, that you're out there on your own. No, the Lord is saying, no, no, no. I'm your keeper. I am your shade. In other words, I will bring you relief. And I will keep your righteousness. Then he uses an example. The sun Referring to the day, you know, in the daytime, we have problems. In the nighttime, we have problems. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. In other words, in the daytime and in the nighttime, the Lord is with you. The Lord is faithful. He will keep you. Therefore, you can trust in Him. And your faith in Him can endure even in the most difficult of times. Because He will never sleep on you. Which brings us to verses 7 and 8. And in them we see that enduring faith requires not only reaffirmation of our physical protection, but of our spiritual protection as well. Yes, God has got all bases covered. He is the one that has created you. Therefore, He is the one who will sustain you. Verse 7. The Lord will keep you 
from all evil. He will keep your life. You see how personal this is? This is something that the people would sing as they were marching up to Jerusalem, but it was a very personal song. It was a song of reaffirmation to God. You are the lovely one. You are the beautiful one. I trust in you, and I know that my foot will not slip. The Lord will keep you from all evil. Not some evil, but all evil. He will keep your life. The people of the Old Testament knew this. The people of the New Testament relied upon this. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians 3, verse 3. For you have died, referring to our old life, our old life in the world. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Right? And so Paul is saying, you know, all of the Old Testament promises have been fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have died to that old person, and behold, the new has come. And now your life is hidden with Christ in God. Could we be in any more of a secure position? Right? And it's words like this, it's truths like this that should remind us about the great trust that we should have in God. And this is what builds enduring faith. The psalmist goes on in verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Do you see the language here in Psalm 121? God is hemming us in on all sides. He's saying, I got your going, I got your coming. I got you in the day, and I've got you at night, right? I've got you in every part of your life. No one's going to be able to take your life from you, right? You know, unless it's my will, and we know that people have died for the glory of God, and no one's going to be able to ever snatch you out of my righteous right hand. Satan will not do it, sin won't do it, and the world certainly won't do it. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Again, we've got to see completion of this, fulfillment of this in the, in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one you see how they put a fine point on that the psalmist says he's going to keep you from all evil and what is the, what does paul say in second thessalonians he's going to keep you from the evil one the one that seeks to snatch you out of the hand of god and so if we know that we have that protection if we know that we have that that guarding over our life over our hearts our minds and that it is hidden with christ in god then beloved the only answer should be that our faith should endure during times of trouble, during times of tribulation, during times of suffering. Now people will hear these words and they'll say, it sounds beautiful, Pastor Mike. I wish it were true. And they might even say, you know what? Can I trust this? You know, because a lot of times, even as confessing believers, we say, you know, I know that God can do it, but I don't think he wants to do it for me. I know, that I, can, I know that God can give me enduring faith, but I just don't think he wants to do that for me. Well, when you think that, I want you to think about this. Think about the cross of Christ. Think about the empty cross. Once he, 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 he was hung on it, and now it's empty. And in that, God is proving to us that we can have enduring faith, that Jesus lived so that we could have enduring faith, that he was the, the physical manifestation of the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament words. That's why we can have enduring faith, that he lived that glorious life that God wanted for us to live but failed to do it so that we could have enduring faith. That he died that atoning death for us. Why? So that we could have enduring faith. Remember he said, he said, I have to go away so that the Father will send you the Spirit. He ascends on into heaven. Why? So that he can send us the Spirit that our faith can endure. And he says, trust me. Look at the cross and see how much I loved you and how I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember Jesus on the cross? He says, Father, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you and I would never be forsaken. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know what that joy was before him? The joy of dying for you so that you could have faith in him and that you could trust that the Father has your going out and your coming in. That you could trust that the Lord is, 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 is your keeper. That no thing evil that rises up against you will prevail. Yeah, Jesus lived and died so that you could be assured, that I could be assured that we can endure in faith. When you look at the empty cross again, it's a picture of endurance. Christ endured, therefore we can endure as well. So I have some spiritual takeaways for these verses. These are not the only ones, but they're three that I'd like to highlight for you this morning. And the first is this. Building enduring faith requires trusting God in everything. Not some things. You can't pick and choose. You've got to trust Him in everything. You've got to constantly be lifting up your struggles, each other, in prayer, and trusting God in everything. And the second, the more we trust in God, the more He strengthens us. Yeah. The more we trust God, the more we, we, we submit ourselves to Him, to His Word, to His love, the more we are strengthened and we build enduring faith. And finally, God has proven that we can trust Him through the saving work of Jesus Christ. Yeah, as Jesus you know, was heading towards the cross, He says to God, the Father, I trust in You. Right? And he was putting his life. And that wasn't an easy thing to do, beloved. No man has ever died the death that Christ has died. Sure, many were crucified, but not like him. Scourged and beaten. And the worst part about it, he was innocent. And sometimes we feel like, you know, the world is beating down on me and I've done nothing wrong. It's those times that God is saying, lift your eyes to the hills. Because it is from me that your help comes. And I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Christ has died to prove that. So let us put our full faith and trust in God that our faith may endure. Let us pray. Our Holy Father, most gracious God, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your love. We praise you for your saving grace. We praise you, O God, that you have completed the work of salvation. And as we trust in you, Heavenly Father, our faith will grow, our faith will be strengthened, and we will be able to endure all things. Bless this to us, O God, we pray, that we may glorify you in it. For we pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Amen.